All right, good afternoon, everyone. Come on, now I know you could do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, welcome. My name is Anika Daniels Osaze, and I am the Director of Diversity Education and Research for the College of Medicine here at SUNY Downstate. And I'd like to welcome everyone here to celebrate Women's History Month. I'm so excited to have the room filled. And we have a lot to do today, so I'm not going to keep you waiting, but um, I'm just wa I just want to say congratulations to everyone who's uh, receiving an award today. I want to thank all of the people who were part of the nominating committee, and um, I'd like to thank Dr. Booten Foster for her vision for this entire program, and Ms. Shamika Bowman for all of her help. Our co-sponsor is the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, so we'd like to thank them as well for all of their help. So today we are going to start off with our, this is our second annual Dr. Dale Blackstop Women's History Month Lecture and Award Ceremony. Uh, we wanted to honor someone who was very important to our campus, someone who uh, was a trailblazer here at Downstate, and we are lucky to have her daughters here to celebrate as well, Uche and Oni Blackstock, who will be speaking a little bit about her when we start talking about the award ceremony. But to begin, we'd like to get right into our discussion, uh, breaking the glass ceiling, women and advancing advancement in the field of medicine. Now we know that there are many women in the field of healthcare, but when we start talking about what positions they hold, that's when we still see a disparity. We're looking for women who are able to move up into the higher ranks, into uh, academic medicine, those who are CEOs, those are presidents, those who are at the top of their field as chairs in different departments. And although we see a few, we don't see enough. So it's really important to get into the meat of this discussion and talk about why this is so, how we can get beyond it, and how we can continue to elevate women in healthcare. So I have the distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker for this morning, I mean this afternoon, Dr. Monica Sweeney. Dr. Sweeney serves as Vice Dean for Global Engagement and Clinical Professor and Chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management in the School of Public Health at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. Dr. Sweeney's most recent position was as the com Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of HIV AIDS Prevention and Control in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Sweeney is the immediate past chair of the SUNY Downstate Council and served on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS uh, through PACHA and as president of the Medical Society of the County of Kings. She served as co-chair of the Physician Advisory Council of the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute and as president of the Clinical Directors Network. In the fight against HIV AIDS, Dr. Sweeney led the New York City Dep Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's prevention and control efforts for several years. Her service on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS resulted in new initiatives to control disease globally. Without any further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Monica Sweeney. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I know many of you would have come on your own, but I do know that there was an email sent out by Dr. Joseph, who gets an award every other week, and he wanted to make sure that there was somebody here to hear me speak because um, he's in this position all the time. So he's not only here for me, he's here for the awardees. I want to congratulate the awardees before I forget to do it. Um, it's really wonderful what the um, two offices, the two co collaborating groups doing this, offices are doing this, because we have to know that there are many people other than doctors and nurses who are responsible for all the things that go on here at the university, and we need to always recognize them. So I thank you all for that, and I thank you for the invitation to speak this morning, um, this afternoon. So I'm starting with a photograph of Dr. Dale Gloria Blackstock, whom I actually happen to have known. We were, our paths crossed here at Downstate. I did not know her well, but I did know her. And I, I couldn't resist saying this because I have just read an article about the fact that people who are attractive have an easier time in life than people who are not. Now, we don't have anything to do with the way we look when we're born, 
but the God Spirit did her favor, and so it started out with that because she's with, it was going to be needed farther in life as she went through many of her challenges. So I wanted to start with that wonderful picture of her. So Dr. Blackstock had a lot of things to do before, to overcome before she became a physician. She was raised by a single mother. She had five siblings. They were on public assistance. The New York City Department of Health tells you if you're born to a single mom and you are poor, you are likely to continue that pattern of poverty. So just remember that, that she started out with people, or her mother did, telling them you are starting a pattern in a pattern of poverty and you're going to continue it because you're uh, not married and you're already poor. And then she developed severe stuttering. And then she went around from school, moved around from school to school. And then wherever she went, she had poor black women. Just think about how many times when you are black that the intersection of race and gender interacts in your daily lives. It used to be primarily microaggressions in the last few years, but now it's gone back to microaggressions because you, people now have permission to do that like the man on the plane a couple of days ago who told the black flight attendant, I don't want blacks around me. They did take him off the plane. That's one good thing. I'm going to talk about Dr. Blackstock, but I have to do it in perspective. And the history in perspective is really important. So next year is 2019. Does anybody know what 2019 means? to the black community. 400 years in this country is what it means. 1619, so from the time any of the Europeans came here, Africans were here too. There are even people on WBAI, granted, um, I have to quote my source, who says Africans were here before Europeans. But if you look at this timeline, 1916 to 1865 was slavery. Then segregation. Then Jim Crow. And then there was supposed to be the Civil Rights Movement because the act passed in uh, 1964. And 1954 is mentioned on here because of Brown versus the Board of Education, which I'll say another thing or two about in a few minutes. So look at the history and perspective when we're talking about breaking glass ceilings. Institutionalized racism. So I mentioned the Brown versus the Board of Education, but before we get there, there are the slave signs, the dehumanization of African American chattel, three fifths of a human, established slave codes, then there was reconstruction the development of black codes. There's just a book out telling that goes through the path that blacks could use when they were traveling so that they knew where to stop and where they couldn't. And then there is Jim Crow 1890 to 1965 where the codified laws, institutionalized practices, caricatures, and mass lynching. I just want you to go to the bottom line of Jim Crow, mass lynchings. Bottom line of the Civil Rights Movement, mass police killings. Bottom line of 1980 to the present day, mass killings. So we know that some things have changed, but there are a lot of things that still need to change. If a black person had said shut up and dribble to somebody, there would have been a hue and cry that would be going on to this very minute. But now that the climate is what it is, there are people who think that it's okay to say that. And I mentioned 1954 um, before, um, which was before the Civil Rights Movement and the before the Civil Rights Act. But it's now 64 years since Brown versus the Board of Education. 
So who knows where the most segregated school system is in the United States? New York City. Just so you know what we are up against. We do have glass ceilings to break, but we need to know what we're up against in terms of the whole environment that we have to go through. So is Elizabeth Blackwell became a physician in 1849, the first woman physician in the United States, officially. It was about the same time that the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, which was 19, 1850, where legislation was passed that stipulated if a runaway slave was found, it was imperative that the law enforcement return them to their rightful owners or pay a $1,000 fine. And so the security code for the Underground Railroad was tightened at that point. But just remember when the Fugitive Slave Act happened, Elizabeth Blackwell in 1849 was the first woman physician. So she put a crack in the ceiling. She put a crack in the glass ceiling. Because before that, women could primarily be white women. Teachers, you could be a teacher. There are some, there's evidence of teachers. But for the most part, until after the 1950s, for the most part, women could be homemakers or teachers or nurses. And anything other than that was out of the ordinary. I want you all to remember the three-fifths compromise of 1787, that black people were not whole people. We were three-fifths of a person. And when did that change? 1865. So for over 100 years, people of African descent were not considered human. They were considered three-fifths of a human. No way to break a glass ceiling when you're not even considered human or was there. Harriet Tubman is best known for being uh, abolitionist. She actually freed 300 slaves, bringing them through the Underground Railroad. She stopped dropping them off here in places like New York and New Jersey and so forth and started sending them to Canada because it was well known that in New York, somebody could claim that they owned you even if you'd never been in the South and law enforcement would return you or say they were returning you when you were going for the first time. But the other importance about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and the 300 people she liberated was that <clears throat> she was a barefoot doctor. When about 5,000 slaves were liberated in the South, many of them made their way to Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. And she went to Hilton Head Island, South Carolina to help them survive. And she practiced medicine with herbs and the botanicals that she that they grew and home remedies and helped many people who were on the verge of starvation and death and illness and all kinds of mosquito bites and you name it, she treated it with great success. So I thought when we're talking about people to whom we owe a debt, I couldn't let Harriet Tubman, a barefoot doctor, not go mentioned. So Journ of Truth was dealing with another aspect. She was the abolitionist, as was Harriet Tubman. But it was very important that both of them were doing work that would eventually lead to um, the freedom of the slaves. Talking about breaking the glass ceiling, Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first African-American woman to become a doctor. She was a nurse first. I relate to that. So was I. <laughs> so was I. Um, she went to school in Boston and became a physician in 1864. So even before freedom of the slaves, she was able to become a physician. Um, I think I forgot to tell you that at the time uh, that Elizabeth Blackwell became a doctor, there were 
54,000 doctors in the United States and um, none of, and, and she became the first woman doctor. So we come rushing up to the present day, 2015, medical school graduates, men and women, Latinos and blacks. 6% of black or African Americans were the graduates of 2015 and 5% Hispanics. I will tell you, we're glad that that's happening, but it's fewer than graduated from my class here at Downstate in 1975. I will tell you again, it's fewer than graduated from Downstate in 1975. And so we think always about the South and all of the evil that went on in the South, but sometimes we forget all the things that go on here, went on and go on here in the North. I'm a member of the Medical Society of the State of New York. We had a black president of the United States before we had a black president of the Medical Society State of New York. Not that somebody wasn't on their way, but when he got to the year that he was supposed to advance to president, somebody found a way to knock him off the track. Here at Downstate, right now, I hear the faculty practice is getting a new director First time black, first time woman. And so we're making progress. If you go out here and look in the hallway, however, of the distinguished professors, there's not one black woman among them. And with all the black people who've been at Downstate since the day it opened, not one black woman qualified? Oh, come on. We need to look at our own house first and get the moat out of our own eye, but the mountain out of our own eye before we talk about the moat in other people's eyes. So we have work to do here at Downstate too. Then let's consider underrepresented minorities who are full-time faculty who are female. 39% of full-time faculty are females. Black, African American, and all the under, other underrepresented minorities make up 4% of the 39%. So we come back to Dr. Dale Gloria Blackstock, beloved daughter of Brooklyn. Encouraged by her mother from an early, early age to be curious, loved reading. She had her stuttering. She went to a lot of schools. She finally ended up in a Catholic school where the nun said to her that she was so smart she should be a social worker. Now, how many of us have had those experiences where you say, I want to be a doctor, and they say, oh, no, you can't be a doctor. You need to be a social worker. In my case, it was a nurse. We have that going on all the time where people's expectations of us are put onto us and they expect us to lower what we want to their expectations. And so when we're talking about mentors, the mentor is not just the person who knows the subject matter that you need, but it's somebody who's going to be there to tell you, you can do it, don't listen to the naysayers, you can do it. And then Dr. Blackstock went to Brooklyn College after community college. You don't know how many doctors went to community college first. I'm another one. And she met a mentor, Dr. Clyde Dillard. She majored in biology. He was her, her mentor. He encouraged her to follow her dream and to go to medical school. She took classes at Harvard for her last two summers of college, had excellent MA, uh, MCAT scores, excellent academic record and was accepted to Harvard. So what did she do after she graduated from Harvard? This is a woman who had many choices. She came to Harlem Hospital, back to New York City. So many of us get our papers, get our degrees, not us in this room, and then we go off someplace else and go get our suburban five-bedroom house swimming pool, et cetera, and forget about the people that need our help. 
There are a lot of people who don't do it, and many of you are here. So I'm preaching to the choir, but you have friends. You need to tell them. You need to remember from, remember from whence you came because you don't have to be a doctor to be a mentor. I know a graduate from here who lived in public housing. The guys who hung out and smoked weed on the corner, hung out, did whatever they did for a living, they all took care of her while she was in medical school here. Nobody touched her. No matter what time of the day of night that she came home from school from here, nobody bothered her because all the guys at her public health, it, public health, okay, on my mind, <laughs> in, in her public housing project put the word out on the street, don't touch her. We all can do something to advance the people who are trying to move forward. We can encourage somebody. We don't all have to be a professor of biology like Dr. Dillard was, whose legacy is Dr. Blackstock. And then her legacy, but we'll get to that. <laughs> she went to Harlem Hospital. Then she went to Brookdale. She was a fellow in nephrology, internal medicine, nephrology, and geriatrics. The woman, I, I don't think she knew, wanted to stop going to school. And she was very well prepared and board certified with choices, but came here because she wanted to be a mentor to the underrepresented minorities who needed her. In spite of her shortened life, she has an enduring legacy. Her enduring legacy is that many of us may have a glass ceiling to crack, but there are many others out there who still have a concrete ceiling to crack. They come out of homes like Dr. Blackstock, but maybe without the mother. They come out of homes where there's no one to encourage them. They don't have a church family because blacks are going away from the church, which is one of the most important after the home, most important institutions in the black community, or at least it used to be. They may not have a home or a church or a neighbor to tell them you can do it. In spite of that, the concrete ceiling for women is breaking. So I would like to ask, First, Dr. Uche Black, Dr. Stan. What better legacy is there to leave other than two strong, black, well-educated physicians? But then there are all those people that she mentored. There are all those people that she came to Harlem Hospital to mentor. There are all those people that she mentored at Brookdale and at Downstate King, uh, Kings County. So we all have a role to mentor. Whatever your talent, whatever it is that you can do, our call is to be there for all those people who need us. I wouldn't be fair unless I told you that the first person, because I always said I was going to be a doctor, started when I was 12. <laughs> but when I was working full time in high school and getting a special dispensation to leave a half hour early to get to my job as a medical assistant, the first person on that, in that place to tell me, what are you doing here? You need to go to college so you can be a doctor, was not an African American. It was a redhead, freckled young man. And the message is there are many people who are not ours who also encourage us. And all through my life, I've had people who were, quote, other, who encouraged me. Dr. Joe Fitzgerald, I don't know if any of you knew him. He was a mentor of mine right here at Downstate. So I am asking everybody who's here to think of what you can do to help us get over the slave legacy and the 400 years of having our hands tied behind us or blindfolded or sold away from our families. All of us need to be a part of the solution, like Dr. Dale Gloria Blackstock, who is an inspiration to us all even now. Thank you.
Do I take questions then? Sure, yes. So at this time, we'd like to take some questions. If anyone in the audience would like to ask any questions, the floor is open. No questions? Yes, Good morning, everyone. I, I don't have a question, but I can't stand the silence. I just need to. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't be a Quaker. <clears throat> I just, I, I want to honor your mother, and I've had a chance to meet both of you and to work with your sister. And um, what I want to say is, like, one of those 4% of sort of the, the full time faculty that are uh, trying to make a difference, that it's a person like you, and I'm getting kind of really emotional in terms of you being one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say how incredibly grateful I am um, to have women like you who came before me who are indeed taking up that mantle. I'm not a physician. I, I don't have the same training. But you, without hesitation, are taking me under your wing to mentor me in terms of this work that I hope to do. And I will hopefully pass that baton yeah. on. This was an incredibly powerful uh, lecture, um, uh, one that I, I just I couldn't stop listening to you because you, in such an incredibly thoughtful way, were able to map out this, these systemic historical barriers that have been preventing not only sort of women of color, but sort of people within the African diaspora here in the United States to achieve. And I, as a lover of history and a lover of trying to address these health disparities and so forth, I can't tell you how meaningful that lecture was to me today. And I want to thank you. Thank you. I don't know how many of you know Dr. Mary Bassett. If you don't know her, you should get to know her. But I thanked her because the three historical slides were hers. Um, I failed to mention that Dr. Oni Blackstock shadowed me very briefly while I was assistant commissioner at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and now she has my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the two are related, but anyway. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we'll take and thank you so much. And thank you all. Blackstock, we would like to bring up her daughter to give us a few words about her legacy, uh, what she's done here at Downstate, and what she's done for women in the field across the country. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you as Uche, Uche, Dr. Uche and Blackstock. And I have a twin sister, so <laughs> And you know, the, the sad thing is, we went Which to middle school, school together. together. Yeah. So <laughs> I've known the twins for a very long time, but I still have some difficulty telling the difference between Uche. Oni and Uche, but this is Dr. Uche Blackstock. I'd like to bring up this day's um, <laughs> um, um, Our mother, uh, there, there are a few people in this room who actually knew our mother well um, and had the opportunity to meet her. And obviously to me, she was, she was my mother, and she was a, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful mother. Um, and my sister and I lost her at 19, we were 19 years old. She was only 47 years old. Um, she had uh, acute myelogenous leukemia. And she was someone who took really good care of herself. Like she, she ran almost every day, she I ate well. Um, so it was definitely um, a, a shock to us. Um, I'm now going on um, living most of my life without having my mother in my life. Um, and um, her, but her influence still, still stays with me. Um, I still feel her spirit very close to me. And the fact that she has done this sort of wonderful work, even you know, sort of outside of the home, and she's always been a wonderful role model for us. And we always knew that, although being a mother was number one for her, being a physician was right, right next to that, number two. And she was very committed to not only to her patients, she was committed to being a mentor to medical students like Dr. Budenfoster, Foster, right? Um, you know, I, I, and actually you can remember me from when I was when I was a little girl. Also, my mother took us, brought us to every conference she went to. I literally thought that every physician was a black woman. Like, like, so that's why I think for my sister and me, the idea of becoming physicians was not very, you know, it was not foreign at all. It was almost, it was what was normal to us. 
Um, and so um, I think that she would be so tickled and so pleased that, um, that we have this luncheon in, in her honor. And I'm also very excited that this award ceremony does not just um, recognize physicians, but recognizes women leaders across the medical center, because it's so important that we all have, um, can make a difference in our, in our various roles. So thank you, thank you very, very, very much. I am so, so honored. Um, and I, I feel like she's here, she's smiling down on us, and I'm sorry that my sister couldn't be here, but she has big responsibilities now. <laughs> um, and she's also incredibly appreciative. And I guess if I ask Anika now, she, she won't say no, but my sister wants the poster outside to take home um, to put in her office to put in her office okay great okay thank you um, thank you very much dr. Blackstock and um, I, I had the, the privilege of, of calling her one of my mentors and um, I remember when I was at um, the hospital where your mom was, and I got this call um, to come and see someone. Like, I'm on call. I have patients to see. I don't have time for this. Tell them to call my practice. Um, it's your mom. And the message was one of your mentors wanted to see you. Um, so thank you. Um, OK. <laughs> and so this is just the beginning. We did this last year. And you know what? I cannot go on unless I say Thank you, thank you to these two women of Wakanda here. <laughs> who, no, really, I, I, this, this would not have happened. This, you know, I have a lot of visions and ideas, and I think faster than I can do things, and had it not been, and they're laughing, they're like, yeah, we know Carla. <laughs> but honestly, had it not been for Dr. Daniel Zasazi and Ms. Shamika Bowman, this would not have happened. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to let um, Dr. Daniel Zasazi take over because I'm going to cry the rest of them. But I wanted to share with you <laughs> that um, this is not over. The party's not over, as they say. Um, so after we did this last year, I spoke with Ms. Dildy. Where's Ms. Dildy? Where are you, Ms. Dildy? Hi. And I said, um, so the, the, the doctors Blackstock um, were very um, humbled and excited that we were um, paying this tribute to her mother and we wanted to do more. Um, so we are launching the Dr. Dale Blackstock Scholarship Award. We are, it's, it's being developed. Yeah. It's being developed. So I see you're clapping, so I see that you all will be contributing to it. So I will be working with um, Ms. Ms. Ingrid Dildy to bring this to fruition. Um, so just want to let you know that this is her, Dr. Blackstock left a tremendous legacy um, in Brooklyn at SUNY Downstate, and um, there are many students who will benefit from her presence. So I'm going to pass the rest of this ceremony So a lot of great things are happening at Downstate. Um, we had such a difficult time even choosing women for this honor. Even just uh, last month, we did it for the men, and it was hard to choose because there's so many outstanding people here at Downstate, so many unsung heroes, people who just continue to work. They don't ask for anything in return. They don't expect to be acknowledged, but they need to be acknowledged. It's really important that we recognize people for the hours that they put in to make everyone else's jobs and lives easier. So. Um, I will start off by saying that we've tried to separate it into different categories of, of the type of accomplishments and achievements that uh, the, these women have won. And keep in mind that there are so many other people we would have loved to have um, honored today, but we're, we're going to do this every year. <laughs> so we're hoping that we can try to capture all of you who deserve this honor as well. The first award is in the name of Dr. Dale Blackstock, and this award is given to a faculty person who has pushed and um, made every effort to try to encourage diversity throughout the institution, someone who's been an, an outstanding mentor, someone who has worked tireless, tirelessly to make sure that we are able to get our jobs done, that students have someone to look up to, that they can come to the, the individual for counseling, and just someone who is a great role model for what the rest of us can accomplish here. And that person that was chosen for this year is Dr. Sydney Butts. So I'd like to bring her
We would like to honor you by giving you the Dr. Dale Black Sox Award, presented to Dr. Sidney Black, for your dedication and commitment to diversity. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, so when I was actually kind of thinking about my day to day and getting ready to like think about you know being here on time, <laughs> uh, so running from across town, I was throwing some things in my bag and I was like, I looked in my drawer and I was like, I'm gonna grab the, the pack of Kleenex. And now I see why <laughs> because um, it's just this is a it's a very um, you know you I feel like very inspired being in this room right now and. Uh, so I just thank you for including me, and it's really an honor to be um, on this list with um, so many other deserving nominees. I suspect that probably the way this happened is that my mother and father called you or something <laughs> and like, made you nominate me. <laughs> but we won't get into that. <laughs> but um, you know, I just thank you so much. And um, it's interesting. I was reading more about Dr. Blackstock, and one of the things that really struck me was how much I feel like her story resonates with my own and with her daughter. I'm a multiple too, by the way. We can talk about that later. <laughs> and how, um, but you know, just how so critically important having close mentors in your life are and how the people that are closest to you, you know, your parents and extended family and neighbors and things like that just make a huge difference and like the vision you see for yourself so you know when i hear dr sweeney speak so eloquently about the glass ceiling i think another part of that is just like what expectations we have for ourselves and how far we feel we can reach and i think like the greatest gift my parents gave me was f making me feel that those expectations were limitless and you know not accepting even the like limitations i would put on myself like they would not have that None of it. So, um, and I think when you grow up in an environment like that where people believe in you so strongly and those people insist that you're surrounded by like minded people, it really helps you have a vision for yourself that's, um, you know, like where you feel like you can accomplish so many things. And so when you have been given that, um, then you feel like you want other people to have that experience. So I just think it kind of comes naturally that when you encounter other people that are walking along your similar journey, you want to tell them how you did it. And so I think that seems to be kind of the common thread here. And um, thank you again for honoring me. Thank you. And now we will present the Diversity Champions Award. And um, I'm so happy to uh, offer the first one to one of my colleagues that I've worked with so for many, many years. She did abandon us though and like go to another office, but I, you know, I won't, I won't hold that against her. <laughs> Dr. Magda Allianson is currently the, <laughs> yes. <laughs> she is currently the, uh, the coordinator for the employee assistance program, but prior to that, she was a senior program coordinator in our office of diversity education and research. And she spent hours upon hours helping us recruit students of color to the institution, counseling them, making them feel comfortable, making them feel like this is a home for them. They used to call her Mama Magda <laughs> because they felt comfortable calling her and telling her anything and everything about their aspirations, their dreams, their needs. And it was just amazing to see how easy it was for her to be able to comfort these students, how much she's worked to support the office. She stepped in anytime we needed something to do. Our office is a power office. We always have less than four people working in our office at any time, like four max. And everyone has to work together as a team. And she's one of those individuals where you don't have to ask. She just jumps in and says what needs to be done, and she gets it done. And it was just a pleasure working with her as a colleague because we had a lot of fun together. And it's great to still be able to work with her um, through the Diversity and Inclusion Office. So I'd like to bring up Dr. Magda Allianson. Thank you. Yeah, um, 
My mother used to write things down and I used to laugh at her, but guess what I did? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Sweeney, for this, for your wonderful lecture um, and the daughters of Ms. Dale Blackstock. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Anika Daniels Osaze and Dr. Carla Bruton Foster and your awards committee for this award. I'm going to channel my Michelle Obama. Michelle <laughs> um, <laughs> Obama once said in one of her speeches, some folks out there seem to have a different perspective. They seem to view our diversity as a threat to be contained rather than a resource to be tapped. They tell us to be afraid of those who are different rather than the optimism and openness that have, allowed, that have always been the engine of our progress. I've been at SUNY Downstate for almost 12 years now, and 11 of them were spent, as Anika said, working with underrepresented minority students in the Emmy program. The biggest highlight of my, um, well, I shouldn't say career, but it is my career, for um, as an Emmy coordinator was building relationships with students and watching them walk across that stage during commencement and moving on to become successful physicians in their chosen specialty. And now in my new role, I hope to continue to assist downstate, the downstate community by increasing wellness and helping individuals navigate through work and life transitions. I want to acknowledge my sister, who is my biggest role model today, and my niece, who's right there through the door, <laughs> um, for their constant support. And to my fellow awardees, colleagues, and friends, I want to leave you with this quote that I read a long time ago. It states, you are where you are in life because of what you believe is possible for yourself. And possibilities are endless. Thank you so much, and I'm very honored. Wow. <laughs> that was powerful. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle Obama. <laughs> and now our next awardee in the Diversity Champions category, I feel like I'm at the Oscars, <laughs> is Dr. Mary Valmont. Dr. Valmont is the Director of Health Sci the Health Science Academy here at the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. And she's someone who has supported our office from day one. Another person who has brought in diversity into our institution through her Health Science Academy. Someone who has tirelessly worked on every effort in this institution to try to build bridges in terms of community outreach. And that's something that Downstate is really working hard to continue in terms of legacy. She's someone who's here all day and all night long. 10 o'clock, she's here, okay? 8 o'clock in the morning, she's here. She's working from home. She's always working to make sure that things happen. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today. She finally took a break. <laughs> the first time I've ever seen her take a break. So today, she's actually away. But her um, colleague, Paradiba, is here to accept the award on her behalf. So Paradiba, if you can come forward. <laughs> um, so this next award recipient, I first met her ooh, 10, 12, 15, a long time ago. <laughs> and um, so I first met Dr. Wilson um, when she, well, in the Department of Public Health. And at the time, I wanted to leave academic medicine. I wanted to do public health. And I was speaking to everyone. I may have even come to you. I, I, just, I just wanted to leave academic medicine. So I went to Dr. Um, Wilson. I'm like, oh, I see this opening for, um, <laughs> I see, come. <laughs> I, see this, I see this opening for um, a part-time faculty member to teach public health, and I want to do it. And she says, well, while it's part-time, it is a commitment. And will you be able to do that as a physician? I said, no, I don't want to become a doctor anymore. I want this job. And then she said, Carla, I don't think you want this job. So thank you for not hiring me. <laughs> so fast forward. <laughs> so fast forward, um, I am here, and I still think of Dr. Wilson as a mentor and someone who just has your best interest at heart. You know, I think that's what a mentor is also. You know, and she was like, I don't know what's in store for you, but right now, this ain't it. <laughs> so thank you so much, and I'm proud to call you friend, colleague, and mentor. Thank you.
I didn't prepare anything to say. Um, I just want to say, like, I think everybody in the room, I'm really humbled and just honored to be here and very inspired. And Downstate is a place where we all support each other. That's like why so many of us stay here for many, many years. And so I want to thank you for organizing this. And I'm really, really honored. Thank you. And now I'd like to present the awardees for outstanding service. Uh, this first awardee is very shy, has continually said, I just want to get my work done. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's her focus, to get it done. But she does it with so much energy. She's always someone who has reached out to our office to help us find the best spaces when possible. We struggle to even get this space. But she pushed and pushed and pushed to try to find us a location because she knows how important these types of events are for our institution. She's someone that I can call at the last minute and say, please, I need this. I know I'm not supposed to, and I apologize. <laughs> but she's always been able to find a way to make it happen. And she does it quietly and with grace. So now I know where she gets her name from. So I'd like to bring up Ms. Gracelle Hodge Cannon. <laughs> But, um, Miss Madge Edmead? She's like, yes. Okay. So, I, when I, I went to medical school here um, several decades ago, and I remember Madge. And she was as warm, caring, hardworking as she is now. And when I came back, she's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. And that's what. You know, that's what makes this place home to me, that people remember you when you were students. And the same care that she gave to me when I was a student, I see how she interacts with the students that comes to the dean office. So Madge, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, from the bottom of my heart, for making me feel like I, like family. So thank you. Thank everyone. Like Anika, I know that you are basically always complimenting me and you too, <laughs> you know, and everyone. So I want to thank everyone for doing that. And um, I'm honored, um, humbled to receive this award. Thank you very much. So Ms. Thelma Menz, I don't even know if we have enough time. <laughs> but one thing that we haven't done here at Downstate is honor people that don't work within the actual institution. They, in Sodexo, they would be considered consultants to the institution. But they're just as much a part of Downstate as all of the rest of us. Without them, we are not able to eat. We are not able to get our work done. And I know you all like to eat. <laughs> but the way it's done, Ms. Menz, gives you a smile every day. She knows what you like and what you can't eat. There are times when I've almost ordered something, she's like, no, you can't have that. You don't eat pork. You don't eat red meat. <laughs> That's not for you. She's like, you can have this. This is better for you. <laughs> she's like the mother that we all, you know, miss and want to have here with us while we're working at Downstate. 
but she's amazing. And that and all of the staff at Sodexo are amazing. I think they all should be honored for what they do. It's hard working for other people. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, you know, food service is probably one of the hardest fields other than probably housekeeping and a couple of other areas, and people don't often stop and say thank you. Mm -hmm. They don't often say, I appreciate what you've done. People are so busy running because you have a short lunch hour, you just have to get what you have to get and run out of the room. But this is the day when we decided we have to stop and say thank you. We have to stop and say we appreciate you. We appreciate all of Sodexo staff, but we wanted to specifically mention Ms. Thelma Menz today because again, like I said, she does it with a smile. She recognizes all of her clients and she does it in a way that makes us feel special. So right. I would like to <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to bring up oh sure. And I also wanted to add, um, so when I call her Miss Thelma, so every morning she knows that I like my um, my 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 eggs, my two hard boiled eggs, and and um, veggie sausage. So when I run, when, so when they run out, she's like, "You're late, you're late. What happened to you, Doc? You're late." And I thought I was special until I found out that she knew what everyone else in line ordered also. And it's true with Dr. Daniels. She will know. You just come to her once. She'll know what you ordered or what you think you want to order, but you didn't. So thank you so much, Ms. Thelma. Great, I learned a lot from you, oh. and I truly, truly appreciate the award. Thank you all. <laughs> Again, like I said, there's so many people to honor, and I was so happy to have Don Q be one of those individuals. <laughs> Dawn works tirelessly again. She's very quiet, but she gets it all done. We cannot view, move through this institution without technology. There's no way we can do what we do without that, that part of our institution. But she's someone that's behind the scenes that most people don't even see. She's in the office making sure that all of us get the software that we need, that we have the, the equipment that we need, and she makes sure that we have just outreach in terms of internet access, we have our emails, and we don't really think about that because it's just a commonplace thing to do. You have to have it, so you just do it. But somebody had to make it happen. And she had to work with an incredibly large staff to make it happen. And it gets done pretty quickly. And I, I could say that I've been in other institutions where we don't have an IT staff that will get things done within a day or two. And the only way that could be done is through a great manager like Don. So I wanted to say thank you and to have you come up. I saw him. I saw her in the cafeteria. She said, um, "You, you um, I'm gonna be with you. Congratulations." And um, uh, I, I am not good at public speech. I'm like, public speech. I need to talk. To you. <laughs> See some, so I said, I quickly write down something. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, but um, I want to thank you to the committee because um, it's a, a great honor to be selected as a woman. Um, in the technology field, we all know it's a minority field also in the information technology. And that I, I want to, I touch machines since I was little. I was folding airplane, paper airplanes and all those when I was little. And I, I want to thank you to the teams that I work with, all the teams, especially uh, the teams that I work closely, the IT service desk team. The, the team that when you are you cannot get your password done <laughs> uh, uh, when you are um, um, having those moments that you need help um, those folks are actually the heroes that they enables me um, and also the the IT leaderships that uh, empower me to do my best every day so I, I need to thank them and um, and I also want to thank the, all the people that are around me. 
because every day when I interact with you, I learn something. Uh, every aspect of like, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know this, and so you teach me a lot of things in different aspects, not just technology, but you know how to interact with people, how to serve the people I love, and um, I, I love IT, I love working in downstate, it's, uh, it's my destiny. And believe it or not, uh, I work in downstate, this is my ninth year, so um, I knew I would, I would have this award, so I picked downstate. <laughs> Um, so thank you for helping me get my laptop. I don't know how to run it, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the next recipient is, um, honoree, is Nancy, Miss Nancy Ruiz Torshin. So, um, Nancy has the, the distinction of, of working um, with Dr. Moru Salafu. And anyone who knows Dr. Salafu knows that he wakes up at seven in the morning and leaves here at like nine or 10. Um, but whenever you try to make an appointment with him, you try to get a student to talk to him. There's a resident who's having difficulty and wants to speak with him. She finds time and she has a way of knowing things that she can interrupt him with, like a student, a resident, she'll call him wherever he is at Flatlands and things that can wait. <laughs> she knows when I'm frantic about a grant and she's like, well, I don't usually do this, but I'll give you his cell number. And I just thank you for just making. Oh, yes, don't, she, yes, don't give the time. But I just really thank you for just making it easy and just facilitating, you know, what we do. And, and you know what? We're the Office of Diversity, Education, and Research. And so, okay, so you're saying, well, why are we giving outstanding service awards? Because that's what diversity is. It's really creating an environment where everyone feels that they're welcome. Irrespective of your race, gender, orientation, ability, beliefs, or not, you come into a place and there are people like this who make you feel welcome, like you're part of the family. That's diversity. So each and every, each individual here is really a champion for diversity. And we just want to thank you for all that you do. Dr. South was working. <laughs> and we just wanted to thank you so much. support me today, um, but I also want to thank my administrator, Joshua Crandall, and my chair, the best boss, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Sally Fu. Um, and I mean, I think I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the ladies in medicine and leadership and, that I work with, that they always support me and always have my back, always, and I want to say thank you. I know they couldn't all be here today, but Thank you. All right, and last but not least, oh, I've worked with Tanisha for so many years, and she has helped me get out of so many binds. <laughs> I will say probably the hardest working office is this accounts payable and purchasing. And I know they get a lot of flack because there's so much to do. And there's this, uh, so there are times when they're so understaffed, but everyone here needs something from that office. No matter what, we can't function. Downstate would not be open without accounts payable and purchasing. And I know uh, there are many times that we're calling, it's always about complaints. <laughs> it's it's re very rarely we call to say, thank you for getting that done. Thank you for pushing that along. Thank you for getting that paid. You know, thank you for even giving me advice on how to get through the process, which we know changes from time to time. <laughs> but the one thing about Tanisha is she will work on cases that aren't even hers. You know, there are times when I, I might not be able to reach the individual working on the paperwork that I have, but I can always call her, you know, to her disadvantage, unfortunately, <laughs> because she picks up. But she does it without complaining. She does it because she wants to get it done. She wants to get it done. She wants people to be happy. 
And that's what her whole focus has been since I've been here. And I've been here now for 18 years. I'm not even sure how long <laughs> Tanisha's been here, but she has helped me countless times to get all the stuff that we do done in the office. So at this time, I'd like to bring her up and say thank you, <laughs> Ms. Tanisha Ransom. extremely shy so <laughs> I'll do my best first I want to say that now that I have uh, actually heard about dr. Black Dale Blackstock that I'm really extremely honored to be receiving this award and I've been here for 17 years <laughs> yeah and accounts payable and um, it's just been an honor to work with everyone and to you know just put my best foot forward so I'm always willing to go beyond you know what I'm supposed to do um, to make people happy and um, I just want to thank everyone here who's you know supports me and, and who acknowledges me and just thank you I'm honored thank you <laughs> At this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Kevin Antoine to give us some words from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which uh, also helped to co-sponsor this event. Dr. Sweeney, for that outstanding lecture. Woo! Those kind of presentations that uh, are not fictionalized, but just tell it like it is, because that's the only way that we're going to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And what I also wanted to say real quick about when Dr. Sweeney was doing her presentation where we were talking about the three-fifths, what African-American are, they weren't counting the women. It was just the men. When they had the original Voting Rights Act in uh, 1865 at the Reconstruction, that only gave black men the right to vote. So even within the race, we still got issues that we have to do. So again, we want to thank everybody for coming out here. Um, this is the fun part of diversity. Uh, the other part of diversity where you got to roll your sleeve up, get things done, be the bearer of news sometimes that people don't want to hear. That's the only way that we progress, and that's the only way that we get things done. So on behalf of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, I just want uh, our staff to be recognized real quick. Of course, we saw Dr. Ali Alcyon. She's got the award. Uh, Tahisha Williams, the uh, administrator of the office, and uh, John Dell Goldsmith, our director of the office, and our Title IX advisor. So I'm sure we got some, there's uh, lunch. I want everybody to go out and enjoy it. And, you know, just remember, um, diversity is in two parts. We got the part that we can celebrate, and then we got the part that we have to do the hard work. All right? So let's continue the hard work. Thank you. And just thank you, everyone, for coming out. We'd also like to thank um, our audiovisual team um, who helped to make this possible. So thank you.